So why does everybody keep saying that Psalm 22 is about the Messiah? Why? What what is the proof? Where's the proof of that? You know, there's been lots of controversy about that, right? In, in Psalm 22, most people who are Christians believe it. Yes, it is about the Messiah or uh, Messianic Jewish people in Israel that believe in the Messiah. They believe it is too. But a lot of my Jewish friends don't believe that. Well, there's proof and there's a great mystery in it. I'm going to show you what it is. And it's in verse six or possibly verse seven, if you're reading your Tanakh. By the way, I love, I have a a Torah right here, and I love studying these Jewish scriptures. They're very important. The way that the the original Hebrew was, and all that kind of stuff. Very important stuff. And uh, hey, by the way, if you haven't subscribed yet, you may want to consider subscribing to my channel because what we do in this channel is we go through the whole of Scripture, all of it, because the Scriptures explain the Scripture. The Bible explains the Bible, right? And that's what this channel's about. Out. And you're going to find great value in that because things like the book of Revelation are explained in the Old Testament. In fact, in the Torah, you find a lot of explanation for the book of Revelation, just like Joseph's story, Moses' story. There's secrets, not secrets so much as mysteries that are revealed that God put in there, gems that he put in there so that we could understand these books, you guys. So let's get into Psalm 22. We're going to look at this verse six, the crimson worm or the tola, the tola shani. The tola shows us this amazing story, that this little creature, how it lives and its history will show you proof of the Messiah, proof that Yeshua Mashiach, Yeshua is the Messiah or Jesus is the Christ. Christ is just the Greek for Messiah. You're going to see that in this episode, guys. All right. It's exciting. I can't wait. All right, Psalm 22. It starts like this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So why is that important? Well, now the Gospels record, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they record that uh, that Jesus cried this out from the cross. I can't remember which gospel it was. One of them has the exact same wording. My, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what was Jesus doing? Well, back in those days, the rabbis would do that. They would take you, they would state the first sentence of a scripture because it didn't have the verse numbers like we do today. Even the Jewish Bible has verse numbers and chapter numbers. They didn't have that. So they would just say the first sentence. And then the students would go to that page or that part of the scroll. Well, that's what we see Jesus doing from the cross. He says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In other words, turn to Psalm 22. Some of those standing around the cross, I'll bet you, did exactly that in their minds because they had the scriptures memorized in their minds. Some of them, I, I promise you, t- turned in their mind to Psalm 22 and they realized, oh, this is being revealed right before my eyes because he was despised and rejected. They wagged their heads at him. They, There's so much to it. They pierced, I know that's controversial in verse 16, they pierced my hands and my feet, but some of the oldest manuscripts like the Septuagint say that he bore, they bore through my hands and my feet. Now, was this the Jewish people that was doing that? No, it was the Roman soldiers. It was the world. It was our sin that crucified Jesus. And it wasn't even that. He decided to go. God became the perfect sacrifice. He decided to suffer for our sins and put himself on that cross. He became sin who knew no sin. That's what the scriptures tell us in Hebrews. But let's continue on to this psalm because you're going to be amazed, my friend. Stay tuned. You're going to see something in the end of this that's going to blow your mind. (laughs) It's just, you're going to know for sure whether or not this is a psalm about the Messiah. Okay, you're going to see it. All right, here we go. So it starts off with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then in verse 6 or verse 7, if it's your Hebrew Bible, it says, but I am a worm. And that word is tola, T-O-L-A, apostrophe A-T, that tola, and not a person. So why is that important? You're going to see. This creature right here, you guys, is that tola. This is a very close up of it. It's actually seven millimeters across when it's fully grown. And it turns this crimson red color. So in ancient Israel, my friend, 
In ancient Israel, they would actually harvest these off of the trees. They would scrape them off of the trees when they were ready to give birth like this, and they're stuck to a, they would stick themselves to a tree, and they would collect them and dry them out, and then they would crush them and make a powder out of them, right? So that they could have the dye, the red dye for the fabrics of the temple and things like that. Here's one on a limb of a tree. And they're, they're on these common Kermes oak trees in Israel today. If you're in Israel, my friend, you could find these like in July. You can go to these Kermes, the oak trees in Israel, and you could find these on the tree. And this is how your ancient ancestors collected them. They would collect these to get the red dye for the fabrics of the temple, the priestly garments, the, the red dye, the scarlet dye for the scapegoat that was tied, the yarn that was tied around the scapegoat scapegoat. All of that was from this. By the way, <laughs> Starbucks actually was using these same worms. They're actually a grub and they would use it for the organic red dye for their drinks and some of their treats. It's in women's red lipstick, all these different things. So you are more connected with this worm of Psalm 22 or the Tola Shani of Psalm 22 than you realize. All right, let's get, let's continue on. So here's the powder from the crush. These are the dried out tolas, right? The ones that they, they look like this when they scraped them off the tree, and then they dried them out, and then they crush them to get this powder so they can roll them with like a, a roller here. Like, a you know, you can use that, or you can use like a, a stone uh, a deal to, to grind them up. And then that's how, look at how red that is. See that? Isn't that amazing? Okay. Then they would collect it. So you get this, this red dye and they would get boiling water with this red dye. And then they would dip the temple fabrics, uh, you know, for the priestly garments, for the sashes for the priests, also for the, uh, the ephod that was made for the uh, high priest. And, you know, those little pomegranates that hung from the hem, all those things were from this tola, this red dye. They also used it for medicinal purposes, too, that I read. It was kind of interesting. It was for the heart, for an irregular heartbeat. Uh, very interesting stuff. So <laughs> that's what we're seeing here in the original Hebrew. And that's what the word, the T-O-L-A apostrophe A-T, the tola, the crimson worm of Psalm 22. But what, uh, where else do we find it? You're going to find it in other places too. But I want to get to this video. We're going to see that in a little bit. But this video shows you uh, a demonstration. I actually did this right here in my studio. And these I bought. Okay, I could buy these on Amazon. And it's the uh, the same, it's the cocos worm, which they harvest, you know, they grow them and harvest them all over in Mediterranean climate areas. But like I said, if you're in Israel, you can get these off the common Kermes oak tree, my friend, off of the limbs of the Kermes oak tree. They stick themselves to it uh, and, and you can see them. But here they are. This is kind of, I believe, how, my, how they may have harvested them and, and made the dye in ancient Israel because this is like a stone little grinding bowl here. And I, and I went ahead and ground it a little bit, not as much as, as they might have been in Israel, but I ground them up and you could see there's like a red powder already coming out of this, the crimson red color. And it's just amazing. I love this stuff, right? Don't you? And by the way, guys, if you haven't subscribed yet, you may consider subscribing to this channel because you're going to get more content like this, valuable content, and it's going to bless you. I guarantee you, I promise you, you're going to get wisdom and knowledge and be blessed by it. See that color? Look at the color of that. Crimson red. Amazing, is it not? So it's crushed when you crush it. Like Isaiah 53, they, he was crushed for our iniquities, right? That's what we see. So then you take this crushed tola or tola shani. The shani means, whoops, I spilt there. <laughs> All right, my wife, I, if I get that on the carpet, I'm in big trouble. Anyway, guys, the shani is the, um, the you know, it's, it's the, it's a scarlet. So the shani is scarlet and then the tola is uh, the worm, right? The grub that makes this color. So it's the scarlet worm. You might hear it pronounced like that too. So look at that color. So here's a, a piece of, of yarn, um, and it's actually kind of like a rope, actually. It's some strong, really strong string. Or like a, but look at the color. Remember the, the crimson yarn or the crimson rope that was hung down from when jo in the book of Joshua, right, by Rahab, the prostitute? Isn't that amazing, you guys? Look at that. And also, I learned this from the One for Israel videos, but they would take the scarlet yarn and they had it in the temple 
And Jewish tradition, this is not in the Bible, but this is Jewish tradition, is that on Yom Kippur, see there's one stuck to a, a, a limb that I put it on there. It's kind of out of focus, but there you could see it right there. But they would take this scarlet yarn and they on Yom Kippur, it would turn as white as snow. Isn't that amazing? And that was Jewish tradition. And then they said after the, the death and the resurrection of Yeshua Mashiach or Jesus Christ, it did not turn white anymore. There was no need for it to because Jesus fulfilled all of those scriptures. He is the way to make your sins as white as snow because he is Lord and King. And he was that perfect sacrifice. Here's one on a board. You can see how it turns red. And there's an amazing story in this because this little creature, you guys, one time in its life, okay, one time in its life, will climb up a tree and it will stick itself to either a piece of wood or a tree and it would dye that spot, it would be crimson red, okay? And it would swell up and then it would burst open. Remember Jesus' heart burst open and water mixed with blood came out? And it did this one time in its life, this little creature, one time to give birth to its offspring and then it would die. So that little creature stuck to a tree, get this, for three days. And then after that, it would turn as white as snow and fall to the ground like a snowflake. Isn't that amazing? Like manna, like the bread of heaven. And that brings us to a scripture that I want to take you to here in a minute. And you're going to be blessed by it, guys. But here it is again. But I'm a worm, a tola, and not a person. This is Psalm 22, written by David 1,000 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, before the birth of Yeshua Mashiach. Isn't that amazing? So I did an earlier video on Psalm 22 about the Tolashani and somebody commented on it and I want to show this to you because it was really cool and she gave some great insight into this uh, right here. Here it is. So she said that uh, Olat or Tov Lemend Ayin Tov in Paleo Hebrew the tov is a cross. So it begins and ends with the cross. Lamed is the staff of authority or like the, like he will rule with an iron rod, right? Isn't that amazing? So the ayin, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but the ayin is a picture of the eye and means to see or to behold. So if you spell it tola, like most of the uh, Hebrew text will show you, right? Or your Bibles, you lose all of that. It is in fact in Psalm 22, verse 7 in the Hebrew Torah that it is spelled tola, T-O-L-A, apostrophe A-T. The word, the, excuse me, she said the world will twist anything to get the cross and Yeshua to be left out. Isn't that amazing? So Barb, thank you so much for posting that. And uh, wow, that was some great insight and you deserve credit. I, I am amazed by that. And I want to look more into that. Um, just so, hey, all of you guys dig into the scriptures. You'll be blessed. <music> And it says, I am a disgrace, a disgrace of mankind and despised by the people. Remember in Isaiah 53, he was despised and stricken, you know, and he was crushed for our iniquities. Isn't that amazing? It just all connects you guys. So how much less, this is the book of Job where we see this Tola. Now watch this. How much less man, that is a worm, which he said Rima, which is more like a maggot, and the son of man who is a tola, a worm, but that Hebrew is tola. Son of man, a tola, but man, the rimah, which is just a little maggot. There's a distinction here in the book of Job. Why? Well, we're going to see why. 
Son of man is also used for the Messiah, right? In Daniel and other places we know. Um, I'll go to the full screen so you can see all the scripture. But we know that uh, it's also used for the Messiah who is the ancient of days. Son of man, ancient of days. And that's in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. So he says here, he says, come now in Isaiah Isaiah 118. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, that's that shani we talked about, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be as be red like crimson, and that word in the Hebrew is tola, they shall be as wool, like lamb's wool, white as lamb's wool. Isn't that amazing, you guys? God put that in the scriptures for a reason. Just like, remember, we talked about the the scarlet yarn tied around the scapegoat, but also the scarlet yarn that the priest saw that on Yom Kippur, according to Jewish history, it would turn as white as snow. But then after Jesus' death and resurrection, it wouldn't. That's recorded in history. Why? Because Jesus can make your sins as white as snow. Nobody else. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father. In other words, you can't go to heaven except through him. So if you haven't received him, you may want to think about receiving him. You may be feeling a conviction in your heart. Maybe the Holy Spirit's working in your heart right now. And if that's you, my friend, you could say a prayer at the end of this episode to receive and believe and become a child of God through Jesus Christ. All right? So stay tuned. All right, here we go, guys. So back to it. They shall be as white as snow. Isaiah 118. Amazing stuff. White as snow. Look at the screen. Purposely did that so you can see what white looks like. (laughs) There's no spot or blemish. And I don't mean like white in a racist way either. I mean, come on. I mean, how pure and clean this is, like snow, right? All right, let's continue here. So a partial hardening, we see this in the book of Romans, okay? This is Paul writing this. Paul wrote in the book of Romans, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. When did Paul write Romans? Around 57 AD. And by the way, I'm doing a series in Romans. You might want to check out those teachings. It's, it'll bless your heart. But Paul, who was a very Jewish man, who was being trained up to be one of the great rabbis and Pharisees, knew the scriptures inside and out. And he loved the Jewish people. In fact, he, he even said I, I would, that I would be cursed forever so that my brethren, my Jewish people, would, would live with God in heaven. That's, that was his heart, just like Moses. So Paul, in Romans chapter 11, God inspired him to write these words. Let's look at that again, guys. A partial hardening has happened. This is verse 25 of Romans chapter 11. A you know, the New Testament here. A partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Then it says, and remember he wrote it in around 57. He was very Jewish, guys. 57 AD. Then it says that all of Israel will be saved after that. We're going to get to that, but let's read this too. This is going back to 17 and 18 of that chapter, verses 17 and 18. The Gentile church is the wild olive branch grafted onto and nourished by the true olive tree, a biblical symbol for Israel, right? He, he states that in there too. So here it is again, Romans eleven twenty five. 25. Some of the people of Israel have hard hearts, but this will last only until the full number of Gentiles has come to Christ. So that's like, I think, like the rapture of the church, right? When that last believer receives and believes in Jesus Christ, and that could be you, my friend. So <laughs> if it's you, hey, give your life to him tonight, all right? <laughs> Because when that last number has come into Jesus Christ, I believe that that's when he, we are caught up to be in the air with him, as Second Thessalonians says, or I'm sorry, First Thessalonians, and we, is it Second? I don't know. Anyway, but we'll be with him in the air and with him forever after that. And I believe that's when that tribulation period starts, that seven-year tribulation, right? Just like Joseph, who was a big type and picture of Jesus, sold for silver, all these different things, Right. But that seven-year period, that great famine over all the face of the earth came, and that's when 
He saved all of Israel. He had a Gentile bride with him already. She was safe and secure in the palace with him. But when that last piece of grain was collected during the the great harvest, then there was a seven-year time of great trouble, like Jacob's trouble, and that's when Israel was saved, all of it. And Joseph, being a type of Jesus, a type and picture of him at the right hand of the throne, he saves them, and he forgives them, and he reveals that he is alive. Woo, wow. See the picture, you guys? Isn't that amazing? So here, Paul mentions it. Full number of Gentiles comes to Christ, and then all of Israel will be saved, the scripture says. So Joseph's story, we looked at that, how he showed this big picture of Jesus Christ. I'm going to do an episode on that as well. Now, I want to mention this, guys. Jesus loves Israel. Did you know that? Some people, you know, church history is littered with, with, uh, you know, anti-Semitism, even Martin Luther, Augustine, all these guys, they were anti-Semitic and it was not good and it was not biblical. In fact, Martin Luther had a hard time with Romans. He didn't like Romans chapter 11. He liked Romans, but not chapter 11. And he didn't like Revelation. Why? Because in both of those books, inspired by God, we see that God has a plan to save a remnant of Israel, to save Israel one day. Why did he not like that? That's strange. It's really weird. That's why I don't trust men in history or church history. I trust what the word of God says. Okay, that's it. <laughs> I don't teach through books anymore in my Bible studies and things like that for that reason. Okay, so God loves Israel. God you are still the apple of his eye if you're my friends in Israel. You still, he loves you guys and he has a plan for you, you know, and, and why wouldn't he? You know, in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, Jesus is described as our great high priest. So the high priest was always a picture and a foretelling. It says he was a, that was a foreshadowing of him. So what was over the heart of the high priest? The 12 precious stones of Israel. Was that taken off? No. Jesus still has the 12 precious stones, the tribes of Israel, over his heart right now. And he's pouring the olive oil into the menorah, the seven golden lampstand. In the book of Revelation, the seven golden lampstand is a picture of the churches, right? And he keeps that oil poured in. That's the Holy Spirit. And when that's oil poured in, the fire burns brighter and hotter and it shines light down on those 12 precious stones over his heart and those stones glow you see the picture guys all this stuff's in the bible you have to look at the patterns and the pictures too because that's where we see this stuff so psalm 22 can you believe that that little creature i'm a worm and no man i'm a tola and no man that tola shows a Big picture of what Jesus did on the cross, the main atonement for a real Yom Kippur, for a real forgiveness of sins, a total and complete forgiveness. And if this speaks to your heart, my friend, you can do it right now. You can say a prayer from your heart. You're praying to God. It's business between you and him. Would you like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and follow him and be born again to the family of God? If that speaks to your heart, you say this prayer after me. All right, here we go. Repeat it after me. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner and I'm sorry for my sin. Please forgive me of my sin. I believe that Jesus died on the cross. I believe he shed his blood for me. I also believe that in three days he was raised from the dead and he is alive today. I choose to follow him from this moment forward as my Lord and as my Savior. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for loving me. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, my friend. Hey, all of heaven rejoices over one who repents. That means turns to God. And that, my friend, is you. I love you. God loves you. More importantly, God loves you. So welcome to the family of God. Hey, make sure you're you're uh, going to a Bible-believing church or a fellowship and uh, make sure that you read your Bible and you pray every day. Get fellowship. It's very important. All right, my friend. Well, hey, God bless you. And I'm looking forward to our next episode. And I love you guys.